the genetic alien heritage of the human race and what it means for the future. Neil Freer is America's foremost researcher on alien genetic intervention. He describes himself as a journalist, researcher, writer, lecturer, philosopher, poet, and futant. He's one of the speakers at the first Transmute Conference, which is held at the Guildhall in Salisbury from the 19th to the 21st of March, where he will be speaking about his specialist topic, Alien Genetic Heritage. He's on the line in Santa Fe in the United States at the moment, and what he's got to say is truly out of this world. An unthinkable new worldview that takes us beyond religion, but comes from archaeology, biogenetics, anthropology, and astronomy. In essence, we have been created by aliens who came here from space, created humans and gave us civilization. The aliens were flesh and blood humanoids from the last planet in our solar system, Planet X, who genetically engineered us as slave animals by splicing their genes with Homo erectus genes. Neil Freer, good evening and welcome to the show. Good evening, James. That's a pretty tough act to follow. It's pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, listen, I marvel at myself every time I start. Um, Neil, nice to have you on the show. Um, We're on this program always fascinated by these kind of things, and we have spoken to practically everybody who's ever said anything about this. Um, Where, you know, the legends have been on this show, Eric Von Danigan, the whole lot. Now, where do do we go? How convinced are you that you're right? I think that's a very excellent question. To start with, I find that I tried for seven or eight years to break the case of Zechariah Sitchin, who is, I think, probably, rather than myself, the most expert in this line. He is a Sumerian scholar, um, one of 200 in, on the entire planet, who can read a clay tablet like you and I can read the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, after... Uh, I discovered his work in 1976, believe it or not, um, and he has written probably seven or eight volumes since then. Um, I tried seven or eight years to break his case, and I found that I couldn't. I think he probably should get a Nobel Prize for his research and his core thesis. I don't agree with him completely in some of his details, but I also feel uh, that he has put the last pieces of the puzzle in place. Uh, as far as our actual history is concerned. And so my focus is not so much on the history itself, because I think he is substantially correct that, uh, indeed, as Harrington, the head of the Naval Observatory, who called Sitchin in to discuss the matter with him, uh, feels um, from their observation uh, here in the United States uh, that there is a tenth planet in our solar system. It's called Planet X in the popular press. Um, it was Harrington's belief at the time of their meeting uh, that the ancient documents that Sitchin had translated uh, actually described in more detail and more accurately um, this particular planet than uh, current observation had been able to produce. And um, we also have, are looking at the uh, another criteria, I think, is um, the mitochondrial DNA research that has been done um, in many parts of the world. Okay, let, oh, Neil, sorry. Now, right, let me stop you. Now, as I understand it, using the Bible and various other historical documents, a number of researchers have come to the conclusion that something happened a long time ago that that we haven't actually got a grasp on yet. Now, I, w- I was talking to, uh, to to a guy about religion today. We were having a long chat about religion um, and what why our church is so powerful. Why is religion still so powerful? Even though we're coming into the 21st century, if it were if there weren't something there, it wouldn't have this hold on us even now. But your theories and the theories of Eric von Daniken and others seem to say, well, there's nothing, there's nothing in it. There is no religion. There is no God. It's explained by these ways. Or do you think that these people were gods, had mystical powers, and that maybe we do go somewhere else when we die? Um, I would, my answer to both of your questions would be uh, unequivocally no. First of all, I think that if we look at this history, which comes basically from the digs in the Middle East, 
that have produced over the last 100 to 150 years uh, perhaps 2 million pieces of artifact and historical document, clay tablets, uh, inscriptions, um, carvings, statues, and so on. Was there one bit that really got your mind going? One piece of evidence you could relate to us tonight here that, that really made a difference to the way you think? I have, to, I have to answer that question, no, because I feel that all of the evidence has to be taken in its totality because, as with any part of archaeological um, evidence, it cannot be subjected to rigorous uh, scientific um, methodology where you do repetitive experiments and then do a statistical analysis to um, verify or at least convince yourself that the, the data is significant. Um, we have to take all of the history on t um, from all of the civilizations and make an evaluation. And okay, I, if, I, if I had to point to one mm. piece of evidence, I think that it, it, it is focal in, in the sense that up until the beginning of this century, it was easy for those in academia and science to say that those ancient gods um, must have been mythological for a very good reason, the things they did or which were ascribed to them in the so-called myths, that they could fly through space, fly through the atmosphere, they could use weapons like Star Wars lasers and atomic bombs, they could create human beings and communicate over huge distances. Well, by, by this time, we have seen that by our own technological advances, we can do all those things. And so that, that invalidates that total line of reasoning, plus the fact that uh, we have additional material provided to us in the sense of contradicting myth um, by people who, like uh, Schliemann, a German merchant, who spent a good deal of his money because he, after reading and being precocious enough to not accept um, the orthodox theories, said, I have maps in my hand. Troy, the city of Troy and those ancient cities, which are said to be myths, they probably aren't. So he went down and he dug up Troy. Mm. And so what we're looking at basically is a gradual process uh, of accumulation of evidence and also hard artifact, plus the other um, facet of this is what we call OOPARTS, O-O-P-A-R-T-S, those out of touch, or I'm sorry, out of, ostensibly out of time uh, artifacts like toys, tools, um, high-tech objects, um, whether it be clay pot batteries from 2500 B.C. or a cylinder seal, um, that is still, as best I uh, know, in the East Berlin Museum, uh, a cylinder seal, by the way, for those in the audience that are not familiar with those, is, is a hard stone rolling pin type device that is incised with pictures and text in reverse so that when, you run it, when they used to run it over the face of a, the surface of a uh, wet clay tablet, it would imprint the text in and, um, and, and multiples. It was sort of a, an early... Um, printing press. Mm, okay. And let's let's move on slightly, um, because okay. if, if people are interested, you're coming over to this country, you'll be here between the 19th and 21st of March. Correct. Um, and if people want to find out more about this, because it's not far away, if they give our switchboard a call um, on 01716361089, leave their names and telephone numbers, apparently the conference organizers will be prepared to get back in touch with them. So I'm really looking forward to that conference, too. It, it, it sounds like it's going to be a very high-level type thing. Okay, now these these gods you call the Anun Anunnaki or the Anunnaki or Anunnaki. Anunnaki. Correct. Now, when did they are uh, they, these are mentioned in the Bible, right? Um, they are under the name Anakim. Yep. And they are also in the sixth chapter of Genesis identified as the Nephilim, and they are also referred to as the Elohim. These are the fallen angels. Uh, no. No. These Sorry. are these <laughs> are these are the giants that came down and, and bred with uh, whatever is it. Uh, no, the the word giants is is a is a total falsehood. Um, in fact, that that gives me an opportunity to give you a thumbnail sketch of where Sitchin, as a scholar, came from, uh, where where he got his start. Um, he was studying at eleven or twelve years old in Hebrew in Israel, the Old Testament, and when they came to the sixth chapter of Genesis in the Old Hebrew. Um, the teacher s translated the word Nephilim in that uh, 
passage which is is rather well known where it says before the flood and after the flood the nephilim were on the earth and the sons of those gods plural became enamored of the daughters of men took on themselves wives as many as they wanted and had children with them now what do you believe that means well it's it it in context um put put in context um with the sumerian the akkadian babylonian and hittite all of those those works that we have recovered uh, it simply means that the nephilim which were uh, that word, by the way, means those who came down from the heavens or were sent down from the heavens. It mm. does not mean giants whatsoever. Uh, it was it was simply a mistranslation corrupted by the theologians um, for their own practical ends. They, you know, it was a, it would be a horror to say that it meant those. Came, okay, came when down from when did these beings from Planet X actually arrive here on this planet? Um, as best we can tell, and I would accept Sitchin's chronology at this point. Some four thousand, uh, I'm sorry, four hundred and thirty-two thousand years ago. Now, how long did they stay here? What, what, when did they leave? What, what happened? As best we can tell, again, they phased off their major gold mining operation, which is why they colonized this planet in the first place. They were never here in great numbers, probably six hundred to a thousand or thousand plus at the most at most times. And they came for gold. And they came for gold. Well, how um, do we how do we know they came for gold? Well. All of the ancient documents describe in detail the fact that they were mining gold, the, and, and there is significant documentation um, almost down to the conversations that were held among them at that time from about 200,000 to 250,000 years ago. I'm sorry, the documents didn't mm. come from them. They came from the Sumerian. But they refer to a time 200,000 years ago when in their gold mines in East Central Africa, they had a rebellion on the part of their lower echelons. They said, we don't want to eat the dirt down here anymore. And so the chief in charge of, of the planetary expedition here, um, the chiefs uh, in council decided that they would do a very practical thing. They would create a creature to take their place. So hang on, let's, let's rush on. So I, I want to get a hold of this. So okay. these, these beings came to this planet long before we, um, uh, intelligent life was really here. Well, no, there was, at that process, it, it, I mean, when we look at the, the indigenous oh. evolutionary process, Homo erectus was here. Okay, so these were the, these were the ancient tribes of, of the Middle East and, and Africa and places like that? No, no. These, would, these would be a, prim, a more primitive hominid form. So would, they, would these be the Neanderthals that, the, or, or... Previous to that. Previous, previous to that. Previous to the Neanderthals, previous to us. We literally were not here. Okay, now, they came down, they found this, pla this planet that uh, didn't have intelligent life on it at the time then, really. Well, you could, you could classify, I mean, not to, to split hairs, but you could cl classify Homo erectus as, a, as an intelligent being. All right. Although they didn't, they didn't measure up to our capabilities. So they came from Planet X purely to, to pillage the gold minerals on this planet and go back again. That's correct. Um, but they decided that they needed some slaves to do this working because they didn't like being down here. Right. And then they decided that they would genetically interfere with Homo erectus? By crossing their genes, Anunnaki genes, with the genes of Homo erectus. Now, how... Uh, how do you arrive at this idea? Where does, the, where does the proof come for this? We have documentation that we have uh, um, recovered from the Middle East uh, that describes in detail... The process as it was done by two specific Anunnaki. By the way, they, these were beings that were not the little gray guys with wraparound eyes. They no. weren't reptilian or anything that the UFO community is talking about. These were um, and are, as best we know, uh, humanoids like us. Uh, they were taller and huskier than we are, but they were cr close enough to Homo erectus so that there could be a gene splice. And, of course, that was one of the major... We could talk about it later, but that was one of the major objections I had to this whole thing. How could someone coming from a planet that would was uh, totally distinct from Earth, uh, had a 3,600-year cometary-like orbit around the sun uh, and so on, where the conditions would be quite different, um, actually do match anywhere as close to the genetic code? And the answer is that there was a collisional event and so on. Mm. We can talk about that later. But... Um, because that is one of the typical questions that people, think okay, people right. will, will bring up. Right. Let's, let, let, and if people would like to talk to Neil, and if you've got questions to ask, uh, your opportunity is now. We'll take some calls if you want to call us about this. Um, I, 
I just want to get a, a handle on this. So these beings came here, and this Planet X is still out there, is it? It hasn't blown up or anything. Uh, no, we, in fact, the IRIS satellite, the infrared imaging satellite that was put up by the United States back in 83, 84, um, it, it, there's a very intriguing and peculiar situation surrounding that. I think they, they actually found that planet, um, but those with more than two fingers of forehead came to the conclusion, it seems, uh, that to reveal the existence of that would kind of spill the beans on this whole thing. And do you think that, that uh, there are a number of maybe uh, high-ups in governments around this, this planet that know the answers already? Yes, and they I don't, do. They don't want to tell the rest of us for some reason? I, I, would, I would almost bet on it. So I, don't think, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's just um, a, a bunch of... of um, a patronizing management. Okay. Do you... So, so Planet X is out there, but we can't see it for some reason, because it's hidden behind whatever. Well, it, it, it is described in the ancient records, particularly one particularly called the Enamo, Enuma Eilish, which means in the beginning, um, which describes in detail, and this is why Harrington of the Naval Observatory called Sitchin in, because Sitchin's translation of it was um, so astounding to him. Um, it describes the fact that our proto-solar system formed pretty much the way from the accretion of dust and so on that we knew it, but the Earth was not in orbit early on, but there was a large protoplanet in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And this planet, this tenth planet, was not an indigenous planet. It was not a native planet. It was captured gravitationally as our mm. solar system passed through um, circulated uh, in the arms of, of the uh, Milky Way, our Milky Way galaxy, and was captured gravitationally in there, it w eventually collided with this large planet, uh, the indigenous planet that was in the asteroid belt area. The asteroid belt was not there then, and that collisional event produced two things which um, the ancients knew about. They called the asteroid belt, which was the debris belt from the mm. collision. Now, hang on. These ancients, these okay. ancients, right, the ancients you're talking about, Yes. These, were, these had been, these were the product of the genetically engineered mutants on this, this planet. That's right, that's right. And specifically the Sumerians, the first sudden civilization, who were basically taught these things by the Anunnaki in crash courses in civilization. And they believed, of course, I mean, how long did, what did they do? They were so uh, technologically advanced that they could create these beings quite easily and quite quickly. Then these, these beings then had the power to reproduce. Uh, at first, they didn't. We did not. We didn't. These, these beings that you're talking about are, are, are literally us. We are half Anunnaki, half Homo erectus, and I suggest that we, you know, recognize a new class of evolution called Homo erectus nephilimus. Um, not to be facetious. I think that we should, you know, recognize that, that uh, we are the end product of that gene splicing for the, to be gold mine slaves. So we were originally, uh, we went back to all our roots on this planet, we were originally genetically engineered by beings from planet X to be their slaves. Correct. So, so we had no uh, reproductive um, uh, possibilities at all. Well, the detailed records say they taught us that when we were first created, because we were a mutant like a mule, practically, the, a bicameral species, yeah. in the sense of two houses of Congress or two, two yeah, genetic yeah. gene codes perfused, um, that we, um, we didn't have the ability to procreate. They were, they were having Anunnaki women uh, bear these mutant creatures in, in, in the laboratory conditions, practically. But once they discovered that we were as valuable as we were, they did manipulate us genetically so that we could procreate. Mm. Where, where did they do all this? Did they do it in spaceships or did they, did they do it somewhere on this planet? Where did, did they have huge hospitals they built or breeding pens or what? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just... Well, no, the, that's, that's an excellent question because it goes, it goes right back to the gold mine location. When we look at the ancient records and we put our finger on the map... Who wrote these records? That's what I'm trying. It was really bugging me because these, uh, the Anunnaki or Anun whatever, did not write these records. The beings that that had evolved after they had been genetically engineered then decided to write down some of the history, and presumably some of these beings that they thought were gods because they created them were still around. Correct. And okay. when when you're talking about these beings, you're talking about us. Yeah. We as humans, early humans in the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian societies were taught these things by the Anunnaki. 
um, and copied them down, recorded the history, because we, by that time we could write. We had trilingual dictionaries, and the Sumerian Society had just about every establishment. And so uh, how, long, how long did this take, from them deciding to uh, genetically engineer some mutants to do their, their heavy work for us? 200,000 years ago. Right, 200,000 years ago. How long from them doing the first experiment to see if they could do it, uh, did they get quite a substantial population going? It seems as if um, it only took them um, maybe in the tens of thousands of years, but it, it could have been a good deal shorter. Mm. The records are very skimpy on that particular item. But let's go back to the, your, your question about um, where this happened. Yeah. The ancient records that we have that were, were taught to uh, the material that was taught to us say that their laboratory where they did the actual genetic engineering was in East Central Africa. It was right above the gold mining operations. And uh, what is really fascinating is that in South Africa now, the technical gold mining engineering community um, has, has indicated that they very seldom go looking for gold with a pick geologically anymore. They simply go looking for the ancient gold mines and open them up again. They have found gold mines down there 60,000 to 100,000 years old with traces of human activity in them. So this is, this is one of the, we, we should call it anecdotal, but one of the f pieces of, of fact that, that uh, reinforces this theory. Why has nobody tried to prove or dispu disprove the fact that these gold mines are there in South Africa then? I'm sorry? Well, has, has anybody actually um, proved that this is a fact that these uh, ancient gold mines now exist in South Africa? I mean, has yes. nobody tried to go down and, and see whether or not there are some kind of uh, artifacts that have been left there that would give us more or more evidence or not? Well, I, I believe that you can read articles in Scientific American uh, to that effect and in um, the gold mining journals, or the technical gold mining journals of South Africa, they are mentioned repeatedly. They have even done carbon dating tests on the materials that they have found in there in order to date the... Uh, the human hmm. the traces of human habitation when okay let me let, let's move on slightly now okay. they they got fed up with being here presumably because they were so much more advanced than us and then after they would sort of uh, uh, had their way with the women they created around here and interbred and done all that sort of thing they decided to uh, go back off to their planet did they well they as best we can tell they phased off at least the major gold mining operations and their activities here um, their overt activities here um, somewhere around 1250 BC. How did they get here, by the way? Just they were ballistic technology rocketry, um, all continually described in the ancient records. Hmm. They, there was no indication um, until perhaps at the very last that they had any kind of anti-grav, hmm. anti-gravitational saucers or anything like that. Um, they had. It was very clearly stated that because their planet had a huge elliptical orbit that came in where the planet every 3,600 years comes in through um, the asteroid belt where, it, where the collisional event took place in the first place mm. uh, and goes way out past Pluto, um, that they had to actually, because they were ballistic technology rocketry uh, based, they actually had to find a window of opportunity and carefully plot it geometrically um, ballistically so that they would um, be able to launch from their planet when it came in, mm. come here, and so on. Do you believe their planet is still in existence and that these, our ancestors, are still there? Uh, yes, I do, because Harrington has pointed, pointed out to Sitchin that one of the ways that they came to... The, he and Tom Ben Flandern, the author um, of um, Dark Matter, Missing Planets, for instance, who also worked with Harrington at the Naval Observatory, they, they were the ones who published the findings that there was anywhere from a 65 to an 85 percent chance that that was there um, based on the observation of what they call residuals in the orbital plant, uh, orbital uh, paths of Uranus and Neptune, the two giant planets. Um, they saw wobbles in the, pl in the path that could only be created mm. or caused by the gravitational pull of another planet in the solar system that would be about Uranus-sized. And it's, it is n not... It is astounding that the ancient records say that that's exactly the size that uh, Planet X, the tenth planet, is. Do you think that we're heading towards a time when it'll be in a situation where they can come back more easily again, or do you think they do visit here periodically? 
And maybe even some of them stayed on and that there could be a, a purebred race of these aliens still living amongst us. Um, I would have to say, yes, I would, if I had to bet um, at this particular point, and I don't like to bet, um, I would say that I would have to answer all those questions, yes. I think that there is the possibility that some of them have remained here. Uh, there are legends uh, persisting in the Himalayas and in those areas uh, that there are tiny colonies. Um, I have no way of proving it, um, and I have not seen any conclusive proof from anyone. But could they uh, be, I mean, could they be integrated into society? Would they look that much different to us? How, how would they look, do you think? They would, they would probably, it would be very difficult to distinguish them because the depictions of them and the statues and the carvings and the bas-reliefs uh, that we have gotten over the last 150 years uh, from all those digs um, show them to be, um, I mean, we, we are half them. So it, if this is the case, and I say that advisedly, I have to put the caveat down. This is the best I can see for this week. Uh, this is not dogma. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we are half them, and we have become, I think, more like them over, over time as we move through our own rapid special case of, of accelerated evolution under the impetus of those Anunnaki, the, the engine of, mm. of the Anunnaki genes. So how, I mean, if, if they were around, would they know that they would, after all these years, and presumably they've, they've kept themselves pure in some way, but they could be walking around in suits and ties and stuff like the rest, um, would they know that they were different to us? I'm sure uh, that they, they would. I mean, I think that they were advanced enough so that they would not they would not suffer any kind of, of racial amnesia. As how, we how, how different do you think... Uh, what are the different things they could do that we can't do? Do they live longer? Are they healthier? What, what, what? Um, yes, um, in the sense... That, yes to the question about longevity. They, are they psychic? Are there some of the... I mean, I've always had my doubts about uh, Yuri Geller. Mm-hmm. I mean, we should get Yuri in again and ask him if he is uh, one of these. But, um, <laughs> is, you know, are, are the, what do you think they can do that we can't? Well, at the time they were here, when they were described in detail and when humans were in contact with them, um, longevity was one of the major factors that um, they possessed, which they quite clearly decided not to pass on to us when they did the genetic engineering. Uh -huh. I, think, I think it was quite clear that they wanted a a short shelf life uh, disposable unit um, grunt enough to do the work heavy manual work in the gold mines but not smart particularly enough to give them a great deal of social trouble and um, on the other hand it may have been their first time uh, out so to speak in doing this kind of, that kind of advanced genetic engineering and they may not have bargained for the precocity that we we expect um, Do you think we ran, we ran right and uh, became more advanced more quickly than they expected? Yes. Okay. I think, yes. Uh, right. Should we take a couple of calls? Uh, Rick is in uh, in Dorchester, and uh, he wants to speak to you. He's on the air now. Rick, uh, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. Hi, Rick. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, what I'm interested to know... Um, uh, my, my first original question was about um, the Bible code and is there any connection with this Bible code that everyone talks about and also what about the soul and the afterlife? Um, wow. Let me try to do the Bible code first. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would seem that, they, that the Anunnaki were s sufficiently advanced now this, I have to put this down, put the caveat down, this is, this is speculation on my part. But it does seem to be enough evidence to indicate that they were quite close, at least by the time 1250 B.C., to have arrived at the, at least a, a pretty solid concept of what our scientists call the unified field theory, the unification of all the major forces of, of the universe. And uh, we're working already towards... Um, you know, both uh, scientists all over the world, in, in particularly in physics, are working towards what we call a law of everything, which is a fascinating concept in itself. But because they did um, seem to have arrived at that, we see that their legacy comes down to us in 
uh, the placement, for instance, um, the, the conception of uh, planetary geometry that they held in the placement of monuments and huge monumental constructions, whether it be Baalbek or the Giza Pyramid or whatever, um, on specific spots that are relative to what we call a tetrahedral, uh, a spherically enclosed tetrahedral geometry, and you can um, consult o Earl Torin or Richard Hoagland, if you know him, um, his work, uh, for a description of that. Um, and there are a number of other, other manifestations of a concept of a unified field that works on the basis of what we call self-reference. Self-reference, uh, a, a single example of self-reference is a self-referential statement like uh, the tricky one, uh, this statement is false. If it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. It refers to itself and not to something outside of itself. N now, and, and that's a sort of negative example, but to get back to your Bible code, there is a gentleman in this country by the name of Stan Tenen, T-E-N-E-N, -E and he's done about 35 to 40 years of research, and he became interested in trying to decipher what the, the major secrets of the Kabbalistic tradition were. And, and, and yeah. he knew that um, the focus of the Kabbalistic tradition was the Hebrew alphabet, which is mm -hmm. a mystery in itself. Yeah. And, you know, the teaching is that the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet has, uh, contains the entire secret of the universe. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty mind-boggling. If you can't yeah. get it from the first letter, then you can get it from the, the tree structure, uh, first word or first sentence, and so on. But mm -hmm. to make a very yeah. long story short here, what he discovered is that um, the, the, the letter set, the Hebrew alphabet letter set, is generated, I'm going to do this one slowly, is generated by rotating a three-dimensional object sort of looks like a ram's horn in mm. front of a white wall with a light shining on it so that you get a series of sh the letters come out as a series of shadowgrams as you rotate that ram's horn type figure through a pattern in three-dimensional space which is a macro of itself and that three-dimensional object is generated by the letter sequence and the symmetry patterns in the in the letters so you have a complete um, self-referential system you have the the, uh, the letter sequence in the first sentence say of the Torah you know um, he, there is a yeah. symmetry pattern that he discovered it's three dimensional it generates this thing which generates the letters which generates this thing and so on so it's a completely self-referential system and each letter has intrinsic meaning so the Bible code that you're referring to that has been worked on uh, numerically where there are repetitive patterns and and uh, uh, if you read the, read it in according to the code, you get predictions and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think is yeah. um, I'm I would I think it's safe to say that this is a second level derivation of this more fundamental system that has been discovered by Stan Tennant. Okay, Rick, um, we'll leave that particular question there because I'm lost now. But uh, thank you for your call. <laughs> uh, Alan in Suffolk is uh, on the air. Alan, you're through to uh, Neil. Hi, James, and how are you, guest? Um, Good evening, Alan. The question I'd like to ask, I, 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 I do love your theories. Uh, how does this go along with Darwin's theory? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, it, this basic theory, I submit, resolves the conflict between the creationist and the evolutionist. Um, it shows that both are, well, let's put it this way. It shows that the evolutionists are half right and the creationists are only half wrong. Uh, the evolutionists are correct in the sense that from the time the lightning struck the mud to us, uh, there has been a gradual process of development of species, um, and, but it has not been exactly um, as Darwin put it out um, because it was interrupted. Um, you know, it was a completely continuous process from the time the lightning hit the mud to us as the pinnacle of creation. But there was an, an interruption uh, by this this interference, so to speak, um, by the Anunnaki for their own practical purposes, and, and that's how we got generated. How does this hang with, when chimpanzees apparently are ninety nine percent of our DNA? Could they not have done it with the chimpanzee? Why did they choose the Homo erectus? Well, I think it was because of the capabilities they needed. Um, it, I mean, it is true, apparently, from what the biologists say and the geneticists say, that, well, I've, I've heard anything from 95 to 98 percent. I haven't heard the 99 percent. Well. But at any rate, um, 
when we look at that, let's say three three percent differential, um, it when you look at a chimp and compare them to um, you or or me, of course. Um, there is a hell of a bunch of difference. Okay, we've got to take our news break here. Uh, can you stay online and we'll, we've got a load more calls who want to talk to you? Sure. Okay, stay with us. Thank you very much indeed. Neil Freer uh, is with us. If you want to find out more, he's over here in this country between the 19th and 21st of March. If you'd like to call our switchboard at 01716. Question so I could... Let, let, yeah, let me, do, let me just before you do that. Fine, that's okay. good. Uh, let me just remind people because uh, our uh, security man, we like to keep him busy and uh, feel that he's part of the team here. So, you. Okay, the uh, ju just to kind of uh, finish up on the the uh, central question of, of the evolutionist and the creationist and, and this theory, um, the evolutionists are correct in the sense that there is was an indigenous evolutionary process that was interfered with, and so they have to kind of correct their. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go on. No, I didn't say anything. Oh, I th I heard a voice in the background. I thought it was Alan. Mm. Um, at any rate, uh, we just simply have to recognize that there probably has to be established a new category of evolutionary development, and that is a synthetically generated species. And as far as the creationists are concerned, um, the creationists that, that have held for so long, according to Bishop Usher, that in 4004 B.C. at uh, October the 29th at 9.30 in the morning, I think it was, that the entire planet and everything on it was created in a few days, um, they're, they're going to have to get their act together and recognize that there was a creational event, but mm. it was a genetic engineering event, do you think, at least <clears throat> to the human human being. Do you think there is no chance then of some kind of uh, great sort of uh, power that is directing the way we go, a force for good, a force for evil out there? But that's an excellent question, because it, it allows me to say, this, as much as sounds in, the, in at first hearing that this is atheism, um, this... Uh, I, I, I can say confidently that this theory, this uh, new paradigm, uh, I think it's more than a theory, um, is actually not atheistic at all. It doesn't address the question whether there can be some uh, unthinkable um, entity or power or whatever that can create a thousand universes on Wednesday afternoon and play games with them. Um, that concept um, is, it, it, what we're doing with this theory is restoring our true history to ourselves and cleaning up some intrasolar system politics. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Ooh. Um, I, in, in what sense? Um, was, do you think a person called Jesus Christ lived uh, on this planet? Do you think he was in some way a special person that had, uh, had special powers that came here for the good of all mankind? Or do you think that's a fairy tale put about by people who want to try and, uh, and control the minds and views of uh, inhabitants of this planet? I was born and brought up um, Roman Catholic, lower middle class Roman Catholic in, in, in New York State. I studied for the priesthood, and I was a Trappist um, Cistercian novice for a while. Um, so I know that trip from the inside. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to think and, and get myself out of it by the age of 35. Um, but on the other hand, relative to your questions, do I think that Jesus existed? Yes, I do. Do I th because he's he's mentioned not only in the, in the New Testament but in the Roman and Greek and um, and, and Jewish uh, annals mm. that that surrounded that time. Um, I think that um, the best the best absolute best explanation of the phenomenon of Jesus and Mary Magdalene uh, is given by Sir Lawrence Gardner, one of your own over there, who wrote the book that came out in ninety six. Uh, bloodline of the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. He's um, actually been on the show. He's coming in again in the near future. Um, most excellent. I think his his work uh, is is worthy of a great deal of respect. Um, I, his core thesis. Uh, there may be some details that I I might take issue with, mm. but I've been in contact with him and um, I've I've read his stuff and watched his videotapes. I think that he is he's substantially correct. Not only that, but I think that um, his work begins. To is, brings us to the second stage of this, this whole paradigm. I think it, that his work implements, completes, in some places corrects, uh, the work of Sitchin. So what, what, back to the point about Jesus Christ, in, in, his theory is uh, that Christ did exist and that was, was a special person or maybe, maybe one of, uh, of these beings from Planet X, do you think? Well, he was, 
if if Gardner is correct in his historical and, and very thorough genealogical research, then Jesus was in a line of humans that were, as he used the term, uh, special bread uh, for leadership among the humans. So that there, in, and it's best understood, I think, in the context of there being, um, as he's pointed out, and Sitchin has pointed out, two Adam and Eves. The, the original generic humans that were created by the Anunnaki as slave animals 200 to 250,000 years ago literally were the first humans. About 6,000 years ago, if, again, Gardner is correct in his chronology, then uh, there was another Adam and Eve uh, that were special bred um, who, and whose parents were partly Anunnaki again, which would increase the Anunnaki genes in, in their gene code, and they were uh, treated to uh, special nourishment, and um, I, don't, I don't think we have time to, to even get into to the white monoatomic gold and that sort of thing mm. that he no doubt has talked about. Okay, uh, let, right, before we go, I'm just interested to see where your, your, your view of, uh, of religion okay. was going on, uh, now I know. Um, Andy's a trucker, he's tuned to the program, he's on the M6 motorway at the moment, he's called us and he wants to speak to you. Andy, you're on the air, hello. Hi James, all right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, this Planet X, I think you guessed that it was like a 3,000 and odd year orbit. Um, it's going to be mighty cold out there, isn't it? Um, yeah, that was, uh, Andy, that was one of my, that was the second or second major objection uh, that I had to this, this um, material when I first read Sitchin. How could a planet that goes literally billions of miles out from the sun uh, remain warm enough uh, literally to sustain any kind of life that was humanoid form like us. And and do, do I understand your correct your uh, question correctly? Yeah, that's it. And uh, I was also I was wondering about the gravitational shifts. Uh, you know, okay, it's, it's going so far out, then so coming so close as to get in contact with us. It's going to be undergoing some tremendous gravitational shifts. Correct. And and those two factors uh, actually tie together as best as I can tell, um, because. When you go back through the records that the material they taught us about their home planet, it is repeatedly described as a radiant planet, which could be easily interpreted as having a very high core temperature. Mm. Now, as, as far as the gravitational pull is concerned, that's really fascinating because, um, and it's related because there is a at least a controversial theory within astrophysics that says when a, a body of that type or any spherical body that is rotating around something uh, is rotating in a huge elliptical orbit, um, it is always tending to a more circular orbit, and that in turn creates a tremendous amount of internal stress in that body, which again would be a source of heat. So we've got the fact that it is, in the ancient records, um, described as a radiant body. We have the astrophysics, which would reinforce that. And then we actually have, um, if this is, is true, uh, we have the testimony of these humanoids who came from there that yes, this was their own planet. So um, I, I have to, I have, I, at that point, having absorbed all that material, had to um, say, well, I think there is at least a very strong possibility, and all things considered, that that is true. Mm, yeah. Well, all right, thanks. Andy. Yes, thanks yes. A lot. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, Austin is in uh, Hertfordshire, and uh, Austin, you're on the air now, and through to Neil. Hi. Hi, James. Hi, good evening. Um, <clears throat> am I through to James? Yeah, Austin, come on. Yeah, um, I just want to know, you know the Anunnaki? Who created them? Um, it, that, it, that is one of the primary questions that, that always comes up. Um, I see no indication in any of the ancient records, any of the material that I've read or studied, any that Sitchin has produced or anyone else, that or the, where they said how they came into existence. So the I have to assume, and that's only all that I can do is assume, that they were not necessarily genetically engineered themselves, but they were probably um, the product of an evolution, a slow evolutionary process on their home planet. Or there could actually be a god. Well, if... if you don't know, you see. That's if you insist. Well, there might be, there? Uh, might there? Kalia, hi, you're on the air through to uh, Neil Freer. Hi. Hi. Good evening. I've got a lot of problems with what he's been saying tonight. 
he's given a human interpretation to alien stuff. And I'd like him to make some statements that I can refute and reinterpret with alien knowledge. Kelly, uh, well, um, how come every time you phone me, Kelly, you talk complete twaddle? What exactly is it you're trying to say? I'm trying to say that I am an alien on this planet. Yes, I see. Thank you. Yeah. And I'd like him to make some statements that I can refute. Any statement he wishes. To prove that you are or that you to aren't? To prove that he's wrong. I, be, I don't know what you're talking about, Kelly. Uh, nor does Neil. That's fine, no problem. Good, thank you for calling. Don't do it again. Uh, well, let, let's 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 take his let's take his challenge here. Um, there are two major things that I think we could we could. Um, I, that I would not. Okay, I, Neil. Sorry. I have to tell you that he is he is a regular. All right, okay. you know who gets through from time to time, and I think he's actually pretended, or he said, maybe he is an alien. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's not just a complete lunatic. I maybe, could allow that possibility. Maybe not he, that he was a lunatic, but that he was an alien. You think he could be? I, it's possible. I, yeah. could, I could allow that. Yeah. But what I would like to recommend to him is that um, <laughs> he push for, for for scientific proof of this, hmm. and and because that would be refutable. Uh, for instance, he. It would be good for him to be, uh, and and the rest of us, to push for a concerted astronomical survey that would verify once and for all either the existence or non-existence of that planet, which the Naval Observatory feels that they have already located. But if he is an alien, mm -hmm. then he he must, by definition, be far superior uh, intelligently and intellectually and in all ways to the rest of us. And well, he... I don't, I don't, I I don't think so. Oh, you don't? No, I don't. Oh, I, I mean, uh, sorry. Because. Because let's look at the at the other side of this whole coin. Well, first, we're talking about humanoids that are within our solar system. But I think that there is tremendous evidence, um, even though uh, we paradoxically and ironically look to the suppressing authority uh, for verification, mm -hmm. like the United States government. I think that there are there are, is an alien civilization here represented by the greys, the little grey guys with wraparound eyes. You believe I, they're here, too? Well, I think so yeah. because I I would take the word of you know Phil Corso who was who wrote the day after Roswell for instance I've talked to him personally and uh, he died recently unfortunately but um, he said he was in the Pentagon and was instrumental in producing uh, taking that technology and putting it into the uh, industrial complex and so on. A lot of people have actually uh, discredited him and. Uh these uh, geneticists are as clever as they pretend. They will already know that, won't they? No, I don't think so. You don't think they, so? They, they don't have enough detail yet. Okay. It'll be five years or so before, probably before the human genome is well enough known to be able to even start that. I've talked to geneticists at Emory University, Doug Wallace, who is working on the mitochondrial DNA research. And by the way, the mitochondrial DNA research uh, done by uh, he and uh, Rebecca Kahn out of uh, Berkeley both point their finger to the first human female coming from East Central Africa exactly on the map where the old records say their, the Anunnaki laboratory was hmm. where we were produced. But uh, to go back again to whether an alien has to be totally advanced to get here or not, I, you know, I have hesitation because even Corso said uh, that his reading of all of the materials of the secret documents that came out of Roswell crash would indicate that those aliens, so to speak, that were recovered were actually not full humanoid, but they were android. They had four lobes to their brain and so on. So um, I think we, that it is very necessary for us to distinguish carefully between our own genetic history and any strange species that comes here. Mm, okay. Uh, let's uh, bring John from uh, Dundee in. Uh, John, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Neil. Good Neil. evening, John. Good evening. Um, Neil, if we can't recognize these aliens by sight, um, which is, you know, you say it, it happens, but we, we can't do it. Why can't we just listen to James Hill show and listen to the two-hour interview with the BNP? Very good, John, but completely unnecessary. Uh, <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a nutcase. I, I, uh, think that was, I think that was a good one. Yeah. I, that, that, was, that, was, that was totally acceptable. Yeah, he, he, uh, um, have you got that jingle of him? Play that again, just so it keeps me in the, in the right perspective. And if not, why not? Because you... It will, don't argue with me, ever. 
please. What, the Scottish show? Yes, yes. Don't ever argue with me again, please. I'm sorry about this, Neil. I just have to keep this. Uh, engineers are engineers, and there is a place for them, and in the scale of uh, humanity, they are fairly low down, aren't they? <laughs> He's your slave. He is my slave. I mean, there's no doubt about that. He is my slave. And he's, he's so engrossed in what you're saying, Neil, because he's completely round, um, whatever. Because uh, he's now got a feeling that he may well be an alien. I can see it in his face. I, I think you're making him so nervous he can't put that thing on. No, he can't, you know. He's, well, he's slow. I, no, I've got slow. it. I don't... I, I've got I don't want to know... What? what? Go on. Do it, Eric. Do it. You anyway, Will. No, 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 no. You are as thick as two short planks. So I'm going to come out there and <laughs> smack you so hard. I might even do it live on the air just to boost the ratings a little bit. I think he did it purposely. Yeah, I, I, well, the sex life one. Oh, he's not eating that. Uh, Damien in Gloucester, I beg your pardon, Neil. I'll, I'll take oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Damien. Can I just ask two quick questions, please? Go on. Um, if, um, if, um, these, um, how did they actually do the DNA? Like, combining it with ours, with theirs. Did they do it in a laboratory or a base or whatever? How did they actually do it? And, was, and how do you know we've got their DNA? That, that was, okay, two parts to that, to that question. How do we know that we've got their DNA? That's what I'm suggesting that we do it as a research project on when we finally read out the entire human DNA uh, code, the human genome, to see whether that's really true or not. Because, you know, scientific proof would, would, uh, would be very valuable either way. Um, the other, question, other part of your question is where and how uh, in a laboratory that is described as their their basic medical facility in East Central Africa, just above the gold mines um, that they were working. Um, and um, you, you you know, like we do tests on monkeys and all that. I, I'm sorry, Damien. Could you say that again? The connection oh, is not um, that good. Sorry. You know, we do tests on monkeys and all that. Research on monkeys. Yeah. He's talking about. Yeah. Right. Well, could these like um, aliens still be coming here? And then, like, because we're quite similar to them. Could they, could they see us as like sort of monkeys and be doing tests on us to see if they can find treatments for diseases and stuff? Cool. That's a good point, Damien, I think. Uh, a very, a did, very good point. I did you understand that, that Neil? Yeah, okay. Um, that, that, yes, at the, when we were first created by them, they, were, they obviously had little more regard for us uh, than we do for the chimps and, and the monkeys uh, that we tinker with in our laboratories. Do, these Although, uh, these alien abductions that we hear about, Neil, could this be something similar going on, or is this something else? It's it's pure speculation on my part, but I think when you look at the um, the, the UFO phenomenon in general, that there may be a part of that which is their having reached anti-grav capabilities and being able to do flying saucers, mm. uh, that they're using an sophisticated androids um, to do precisely that, to monitor this planet. And maybe uh, cattle mutilations and, and um, abductees um, partly could be that. Um, but I have to qualify and say it's pure speculation on my part. Okay, Damien? Yeah, but what if... Um, what if... Um, if we're supposed to be their slaves... Were... Well, we're yeah. slaves. Why, why did they go away? Why aren't they still here using us? Uh, um, that's a good point. Yeah. Again, an excellent question. I think that, again, speculation, but I think for two reasons. One is that they probably had exhausted the needs for, for the gold that they were here for in the first place. But even more profoundly, it may be that we be, had become so precocious um, and had become so dominant and powerful on the planet uh, that they realized that if we were going to make it as an independent uh, species with a real racial identity, uh, that they had to leave, that they, they had to get out of the way or, and, and, and let us... Let us yeah. Or did they sort of create a monster that they kind of found that they couldn't really control? Well, that's totally relative. I mean, but, as far as they were concerned, yeah. um, they did try to create... The, once they saw, for instance, way back, um, that... And this is where we go right back to the sixth chapter of Genesis, uh, where it says before and after the flood they were on the earth and the sons of the daughter became enamored of the daughters of men. It turned out, if, if the ancient records are all true, that um, the whole uh, flood uh, phenomena which they saw coming um, <clears throat> when their planet apparently came in through the inner solar system at that particular point, um, that they saw that the uh, either the Antarctic ice shelf was just going to slide off on a layer of slush like we've discovered it could do mm. um and it was going to they were going to use the flood 
uh, they had decided to just simply wipe out us, the entire experiment, because um, the Anunnaki males, the young males, were becoming enamored of the daughters of, of human of human females. Oh, they were fancying a bit too much with our, uh, our right? uh, the, the, the uh, mutants, if you like, and that wasn't, yeah, I, I see. Well, so do you think the Americans and our governments know this? Because if there's a lab somewhere, you would think, why hasn't somebody found it? Because well, if they can get stuff from the dinosaurs and all that, and the well, bones and all that, you, well, you you would think they'd find some lab or some sort of technology or something. Well, there's 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 uh, three parts to the chronology. Um, one is that they did this experimentation and crossbreeding two hundred thousand years ago. No laboratory, if they had even run it for another ten or twenty, maybe a hundred thousand years. Um, if they abandon it or left it, um, there's hardly anything except pure stone that will remain anywhere as recognizable. Mm. Metal will de degenerate or rust or whatever, and Do so you think that's all why the we, materials that we know. Is that why we assume that maybe our forebears were, were not that advanced because all the very advanced stuff will have uh, just disappeared and that it's only that the sort of basis things like stone and some wooden bones and things will have s stuck around? Well, that that is... That is one approach, but the, the other approach, which is a little bit more scientific ironic and paradoxical, is the fact that we do have what we call uparts. We have the Giza pyramid, mm. which we couldn't duplicate probably if we really wanted to, uh, which is is said to have been built by them if right they after the flood. Technology, they could just lift them stones like that. I'm, I'm sorry, say again? If they had um, anti-gravity um, technological so they could just, like, make things flow by reversing the flow of gravity, they could just move those stones like that, couldn't they? Well, they could if they had anti-grav technology, but uh, we, uh, we have no certainty that they did at that particular point. Let, um, let me ask, I'm interested, Damien, you don't sound very old. No, I'm 17. Okay. Do you, I mean, uh, do, do, you, uh, do, do you believe all this sort of thing? Do you think there's a possibility that, that what yeah. Neil and people... you I do? I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of different theories, and what I usually do is um, listen to everything and then sort of try and fix it together and, like, take, like, take some bits mm. and then um, take some other bits and come up with my own theories. I recommend, Damien, and, and I have great admiration for your, your mind at this particular point, because at 17, I was not that far along, believe it. I was thinking um, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, which, and it, it allows me to to um, to encourage you to even at seventeen to read uh, my first book called Breaking the God Spell, because what it really is saying is that if this entire archaeological and linguistic and um, biological analysis is true, as Sitchin has put it out substantially, and I think it is, mm. then we have the opportunity to see that since they phased off about probably 1250 B.C., we have been going through, because we were created as slave animals and we were totally dependent on them, became limited partners after a while, and they put foreman kings in place, um, that well, since they fa phased off, we have been going through a very traumatic transition. We have been going through uh, the classic dysfunctional family, looking up in the sky for daddy to come back and tell us what to do and make everything right. Do you think they're um, going to? I don't think so. I think if they come back, um, well, let's, let's start this fiddling way. around with this again. I don't fancy that at all. I don't fancy that at all. In fact, there was a lady uh, who has been talking about the Bible code and so on, and, mm. um, and writing about it. And uh, she said, "What do you think about my work?" And I said, "Well, quite frankly, um, if you're going up the mountain and take a bunch of people up there to wait for the flying saucers for the Anunnaki or some alien species to come back down, and..." Um, uh, you know, to do a rapture thing, uh, please don't tell them where I am. You know, because when you walk into the spaceship and they stamp a number on your forehead and they say you go left to the gold mines and pick up your tools and your pick and you go right over there to um, uh, Enlil's um, harem, mm. um, please don't tell them where I am. Um, you know, they're going to have a bitch of a time with me if they come back and start claiming real estate and, and um, treating us like slave animals again. Is this, is this a possibility? Are they going to come back? I have to say yes, that it, it could be. Yeah. Um, but if I think if they were going to do it, um, they probably would have done it before this. Mm. Um, I think that m maybe they're they're if if at all um, they're looking at us and just waiting for us to get racially mature enough to step out of adole you know racial yeah. adolescence. Do you think and, they um, ke they're keeping an eye on us? Do you believe they they're keeping an eye on what they started all those years ago or not? 
I would assume that with the level of technology that they mm. had, and this is, again, pure speculation, but I think that they, they probably could monitor us. And if they have anti-grav by this time um, and androids or whatever, mm. um, some of the spaceships that we see, particularly the ones, for instance, that showed up at the time of the eclipse of 1991 yeah. over the uh, Mexico City. See, I've just had a, a thought, you know, people disappear all over this planet without a trace, don't they? And they're never found again all the time. Mm -hmm. They could, uh, you know, maybe they're being sucked up there. Can I just say one more thing? You may, Damien. Oh, listen, Damien, are you on the internet? Um, no. Oh, that's a shame. I mean, you're in, uh, where are you, Gloucester? Not far from Salisbury. If you wanted to go along and uh, and meet Neil, he's over here between the 19th and 21st of March. Oh, good. So, when, um, can, uh, after I, after I go, can you put me through to someone who tell me how, where, Yeah, where? all right. I'll go, I'll get your telephone number and, yes, I'll put you back to Linda. Yeah, yeah okay. Can I just say one more thing then? Go on then. Do you think that they're hiding from us? Because we keep sending up all these signals and all that, looking for radio and frequencies and all that, mm. right? But um, we don't get nothing back. That's and interesting, too. They must be aware, then, if this is what, what Neil believes is true, they must be aware we're looking for other life out there. Yes, yeah, so they must sure. be hiding. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a very good possibility that they're doing precisely that, that they may, they may be respecting us as, a, as an emerging species and want us to get some racial, um, solid unassailable integrity or they don't think of us step into stellar society or they don't think of us very much at all and they think it's like you know it's like us looking at uh, a flock of chickens it could be observing yeah. them and not really being that interested until we feel hungry and we're going to eat one it could be too oh could be dear. Too. damien hang on thank you very much indeed for that i'll put you back to the switchboard sue uh is in south wales and uh sue you are now on the air and through to neil as well hi morning i'd like to know with the name an anarchy came from because it sounded to me when I was listening to you tonight that it sounded like an anarchy and oh. I mean is it is it a different type of language to ours have you deciphered something different does it have a different meaning to the one we would perceive uh, yes the, the the word is is a Sumerian word and it comes the root is Anu which was the name according to the ancient documents of the of their ruler uh, their chief um, what politician. Now? I'm, I'm sorry? What documents? Oh, let, listen, Sue, we've been talking about Let's not go back over that. No, we'll, I, you know, I heard it, but yeah. I mean... Yeah, documents that you, that, that you could go and read, you, you, could, yeah. you could grasp yeah. maybe if you read part of the Bible, and there are documents... But in our, our linguistic approach, then an anarchy today... No, this is... No, 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 no. No, well, I mean, there's a bastardized version of that, and maybe it could could have... Uh, that's how the word anarchy... No, I don't know. It wouldn't, would it, actually, Neil? I don't think there's anything I, in that. I don't think I've seen anything even close. Yeah. No, I Thank think you, you're... Sue. It's just the sort of look and the sound of the word, really, Sue. Yeah, it, it was tonight. It's very interesting. I must if be honest. You, if you it's read, very interesting. you know, they talk about this race of, of beings in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Where? The word is Anunnaki in the Sumerian and is etymologically right. and linguistically traceable up through the Semitic languages, Babylon, you know, the Babylonian, Akkadian, yeah, and the Hittite, so right. to the word Anakim in the Old Testament. Okay, thank you for that, Sue. Dave is in uh, Dunfermline. You're on Talk Radio and through to Neil. Hi. Hello, James. Hello, yeah. Neil. Hey, uh, Neil, Dave. if uh, these Anunnaki only wanted workers or more advanced ones to lead the workers, why are there so many different races on Earth? so many different human languages because communication between workers is vital otherwise you don't know what you're doing that's a good point and why are so many uh, uh, why are some like Australian Aborigines Papua New Guineans and American Indians apparently less evolutionary advanced so they wouldn't be suited for the work um wow okay the first part of, about races the color races are basically skin color and, and local adaptations the biologists tell us that it takes only about 10,000 years on the average to, for a, a human uh, species to evolve adaptations, whether it be uh, to, as the Eskimos have done, short, stocky stature uh, that is best suited for the cold uh, with eyesight and, and skin to match, or uh, like in the deep Sahara right on the equator where uh, the, uh, humans grow to almost seven feet which makes them excellent radiators of heat and um, adaptable to um, th their their hair type, for instance, uh, adaptable to uh, sun uh, protection more than any other type that we know of. 
um, it's, it races only 10,000 year adaptation and I don't think that the Anunnaki actually did any kind of racial manipulation they simply created humans who were called by the way black headed ones uh, from the very beginning uh, well, even, even, in Af- so, even in Africa Neil why don't the different African people uh, speak the same language well remember that um, there is recorded not only in the in the Bible but all the way back to the Sumerian a very significant factor which was when humans became apparently precocious and powerful enough to begin to start doing things on their own um, in the Bible it says Elohim which means plural gods said let us go down there and confuse the languages basically for crowd control you know divide and conquer Um, we have also well, originally, we all, originally the Anunnaki created us all speaking the same language, and then when we all got together, as they, as they first of all created us to work together, but once we started doing what they wanted to, they said, this can't be done, and fix the language up. I, I believe that... It's self-contradictory, what you just said, because, you know, we would need a common language to work, you know. Um, do, you, do we think, was language necessary by these beings? Could they not just, I mean, there, there is obviously uh, a part of our brain that we don't use now. It's, it's uh, been proved, I think, in animals that they can uh, communicate on a higher level without speech. And presumably that must have been a possibility of these beings all those years ago. There was a possibility and, and some evidence to, in that line but i think that it is it is a good deal more pragmatic i i think that um uh, dave has has a very good point here um why have some races not evolved uh, uh, neil for, for example as, as i say certain people in papua new guinea are apparently still at the evolutionary level of stone age man now if the anunnaki is, created them why didn't they give them the ability uh, say that we in western europe have you know, why don't they have this the innate intelligence to you know have developed the same way that we have well, if you if you look at the people in Papua, or or the Australian Aborigines, who I think would be highly insulted if if they heard what you were saying, saying um, that um, in fact the Aborigines, as best I can tell, have a great deal more power as far as ESP is concerned mm. than we do. But the fact of the matter is that you know humans were were created and established in the Middle East. They spread into Europe, and even you know over thousands of years. Uh, the migrations took place, um, and I don't think, and, I, and I, I do think that was one of the reasons why the Anunnaki were quite disappointed with the experimentation because they were beginning to lose control. You have the extreme uh, um, in a, in a legend that the Eskimos have in one part of the extreme northern circle that says we didn't come here by ourselves. We were we are original ancestors came here on the wings of an iron bird it's very possible that they they just started dumping the surplus of us mm. all over the all over the uh, of the planet um so i was very nice the, the evolution of language is concerned it, it it i think it's a very easy thing to see that a natural process would create languages simply by separation of groups okay thank you for that dave nick is in south wales uh you're on the air nick through to uh, neil freer hi nick hi um i just wanted to i'm not a crackpot james well i'm sure you're not uh i just wanted to ask one question if if the alien race created via gene splicing various human people to do certain tasks it's perhaps logical to assume they might have had a hierarchy in their producing i.e. a certain gene splice to produce a certain quality of worker is it possible that any descendants from these races would have inherited memory and not know they were part of that alien line well i i think that your question is excellent because it I think we should address it on a, on a broader scale. I think that what we can see is that because we were created as slave animals, were moved up to limited partnership, and then they phased off, that because we were totally subservient to them all the time, whether for specific tasks or whatever, um, that, that we have gone through this traumatic transition, but that we now have to break that God spell. We have to break that subservient mentality because... It seems clear that all institutionalized religions in it, in themselves are simply sublimations of that old master-slave relationship. And that, that in itself has caused a tremendous amount of separation. Those of us 
who were the high servants in their temple. Well, we call them temples in retro-projection, but they were actually their palaces in the Anunnaki palaces, knew exactly how they wanted their meat and their food served. Uh, they wanted how their bath water was to be drawn. And that group gradually, or when they finally phased off, you know, we're standing there looking for Daddy to come back. We want them to come back, make everything right. The kings are saying, my God, which is a very bad pun, what shall I tell my people now? Um, because they were foremen and always carried out orders. They didn't do it on their own. Um, we, the groups broke up. This is oversimplified, but I think you can get my drift. Yeah, well, the, 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 re up. Oh, the reason I'm asking is because I, 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 you see films like Stargate. Do you know the film Stargate? Yes, I do. Yeah, now there's certain... The reason I'm asking this question is because I've not really talked to anyone about this before, but I could have answered most of the questions that you have answered this evening. Oh, as I if, see. Is this somebody okay, who's I see. already told me it? Yes, I think so. In fact, one of the best examples, I think, currently, is the New Age parallel to what what you're suggesting about yourself and, and i can totally empathize with that um i think that all of us you know are are being pushed by our our anunnaki and homo erectus genetic codes to come to some kind of self-recognition break the god spell take it uh, uh, over for ourselves and recognize that so many of the things that we have been told by the psychologist and the psychiatrist are totally mythological archetypes are literally real take example um, separated from you and me, uh, take the goddess movement, where, particularly in the United States, the, the New Age goddess movement, where women say, I understand, I feel in myself that, that I'm a goddess, that there is something divine about me. I think that it is even more real than just feeling. I think it's genetics. I well, think I, that, I, I'm convinced that it wasn't the gold they were after. It was a byproduct from it. And, and, and that's, that, to me, is... is, is, is is what they were doing. It's not as if I've guessed it. It's, I just know that that's what it was. Okay. And, and, so, and am I wrong in mem mem remembering that, if you know what I mean? I know I sound pretty weird. Well, My I, wife's gone to bed now, so I'm not I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Um, please, please pay strict attention to Sir Lawrence Gardner, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, and Blood of a four-book series. The second one is coming out on the 11th, I understand, or is out now, Bloodline of the Grail mm. Kings. He's going to be on the show in around right about two weeks' time. I've just, so. just rung your switchboard, mm. and they've taken my number to come to yeah. your seminar. So you actually believe, though, Nick, this is interesting, so you think that you, you suddenly had little things come into your mind that you were thinking about, and you have had no real interest in this sort of thing and no thoughts of this sort of thing before? No, no, what it, what it is, is for my, all, my, all my life, I sort of had an interest in the unusual spiritual mainly on the um the the, the, the the healing side of things spiritualistic churches but every time someone's faced me with a question and tried to make me believe it was god or spirit life after i come back with these weird and wonderful suggestions and i've been listening to your program tonight and all that you've been saying neil is what i've been talking about to people for years and they just said i'll oh, get out of my place you're just talking rubbish well, and you know, to me it's to me, uh -huh. it's like if you, someone shows you a photograph and you look at the photograph, you think, oh, I've seen that before. Yes, I know. So um, he, this in, in, inherent memory that he has somewhere deep down in his psyche or soul or whatever could be handed over from, from what was going on. Yes, yeah, something chemical that's mm. just left, that, that, you know, the brain's chemical. Sure. You know, and I'm just wondering whether, you know, you, you pick up these things, and I think partly, mm. partly spiritualism is inherited memory now. Okay. Yeah? Let, me, let me give you some reinforcement then along those lines. I mean... I'm not saying, well, here, let me tell you this. I've done probably 140 radio interviews of this type with call-ins. And the t even in the Deep South, in the fundamentalist Bible Belt in the United States, Tennessee, uh, whatever, um, I've got an 85% positive response, and it is almost a, a, almost a broken record. Just as you're saying, um, not that you're saying, you know, you're a broken record here, but... It's repeated over and over again. I have been thinking about these things all my life. I have tried to put the pieces together. I have these things that I seem to know from someplace. Um, I've not done past life regression or anything like that, but I just know these things. And um, Sitchin and what you're saying and, and so on puts these things together in a package where I begin to really identify and resonate with them. Mm -hmm. And and so um, I, I invite you to check out my second book, not just Breaking the God Spell, which says, okay, let's get it on and take it uh, over for ourselves, but God Games, and the subtitle of which is What Do You Do Forever? God Games are those those peculiar 
uh, advanced things that we will take on and do for ourselves uh, that were only ascribed to the gods. We will become genetically immortal. I'm signed up for Alcor, uh, cryogenic suspension. Oh. Of my dad. <laughs> um, very, very interesting. I'm, I'm I'm not... I'll ask one, one final question. Sure. Yeah. Um, the planet X, whatever you yes. want to tell, you called it that because you don't know the name of it, I presume. Well, it, it is called in the Sumerian Nibiru, N-I-B-I-R-U. X. And you've given it X, though. Yeah. Yeah, well, can, it, can in we, the can popular we, press, it's known as yeah. X. Right. Nick, I'm going to have to move on. Just I'm running quickly, out of will time. That, will that, when is that planet supposed to be coming back again if it's every 3,000 years? Um, a guess. A guess from the mathematics. 3,400 A.D. Okay, you've got to stick around a bit longer, Nick. I don't Nick. know whether I remember it, then will I? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that, Nick. Now, uh, I was fascinated, Neil. You said you signed up to Alcor. Yes, sir. Uh, I did uh, a TV film about Alcor. They weren't very pleased with it, I have to say. Um, uh, because when I looked at this and I looked at the evidence that they had for what Alcor, by the way, is a, 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 a cryogenic facility, they have a place in this country now. Yes, I understand. Uh, where they'll take your head and freeze it, or they'll take your body and freeze it, or they'll even right. take your dog and freeze it. And if you saw the film that if you're going to sign up for, and you, you, you will have seen this film, where they take the bodily fluids out, it's quite horrible to watch, but I, I did a late night TV show at the time and I thought it would be quite interesting to put out for people to see. Yes. Um, everybody said this, you, you know, this will, there will be no way any kind of medical advancement could bring a body back after this has been done to it. You know, you basically filled up the body with antifreeze. Right. Well, you know, we're not banking on on the technology that we have now. We don't have the technology to do it now. But I would simply call to your attention that uh, nanotechnology, um, computer size, or molecular size, computer brain uh, machines that will go through your body and examine one cell at a time, repair the freezing and, and anti antifreeze damage, mm. and uh, check themselves out, double check, and then destroy themselves, um, will is what we're banking on. I mean, I the, the, the thing is, I put to them, I said, what happens if, you know, you've got one of these places in California, and they, I think, and they said, yeah. I said, what happens if you've got all these people who've paid you uh, thousands and thousands of pounds to uh, freeze them for uh, it, uh, and there are uh, there are a couple of earthquakes, or... Uh, well, there's they, a... they've, they've moved to Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, all right, well, that must make it better. And the last time I was there for a conference, um, I, I couldn't help myself. I walked through the storage vault with the huge doors, the, the stainless steel ones, and I, I patted one and I said, chill, bro. <laughs> Let's talk to Erica in Glasgow. You're on Talk Radio, Erica, and through to uh, Neil Freer. Hello. Hi. Good Hi. evening, Erica. Hi, James. Hi, Neil. I, I was wondering why you were on such a physical sense and not in a spiritual sense. You give the impression to me from listening to you that you should be talking in a physical sense and everything is no in a spiritual sense and everything is physical it's all um well i don't think he believes erica in the spirit i mean he was uh, you were training to be a priest in the catholic church weren't wait, you wait 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 no. <laughs> um, I, we have you're to so make... do you, you are so physical Mm. In in what you're saying, and and I don't get the impression that there's anything spiritual about you. Um, as I think I should go back and repeat what I said about the atheism. Um, first of all, I, I think that this is this is not atheistic. It simply resolves some intrasolar system politics. Uh, that the concept of God, as we normally know it, is a sublimation of the old master slave relationship. But what is your one concept? particular one? What, what is your concept of God? Um, I there, there is, we talked about this actually, didn't we, uh, Eric? There is, is, to is, there is well, no not, God. Not in the positive sense. Not in the positive okay. sense. I, I would say that my concept of God is is a non-concept. I, I, I cannot form a concept of what I would consider to be... No, I can um, understand that. I can understand that. But okay. I can't understand why you're talking about genetics and uh, the pyramids and everything else that's gone before and not why you're, and why you're not talking about the now... Okay, now I think that the most generic form of spirituality is dimensional. I think that we are rapidly um, put together metaphysical, spiritual, all of that stuff. And I think that the generic concept for it is that we are rapidly, as a race, evolving to hyperdimensional, to four-dimensional consciousness 
and perception on a habitual basis. Does this mean the so end of religion or not? Excuse me, James. We're not evolving if you're talking to people who are laymen the way you're speaking to them on the program tonight. Because they don't understand what you're talking about. I so, think, listen, I... W Erica, okay, no, no hang on a minute. There, Erica, we had the, uh, a young guy of 17 before who understood it a lot more than I. I don't pretend that I understand everything that uh, Neil is talking about. Uh -huh. But he is putting forward another theory, something that actually is interesting and does actually challenge what a lot of people think they believe uh -huh. because they've been told long enough. Maybe, maybe this idea of a father in heaven and Christ and everything else, maybe this is just a lot of... No, uh, surely, no we're not talking about a father in heaven. We're talking about father and mother or whatever it might be. We're talking about a spirit or a great spirit, whatever it might yeah, be. But maybe that's complete rubbish, I can't Erica. Understand what Erica, you maybe is. that's complete rubbish. Maybe there's no such thing as that. And that what is, is being explained by Neil is a, a fairly scientific and, and fairly uh, understandable way that we can. It goes here. into a physical. Interpretation of it. No, and Erica, listen, hang on, Erica, because I'm running out of time. Now, listen, the, can you not understand that maybe there is no spiritual side of it? Maybe it is as simple as these beings from another planet came here, genetically interfered with the beings that were here. We are the result of that. Well, okay, but let me, oh, let yes, me get my two cents in yes, here. I, I, I believe think, that. Yes, uh -huh, yes, I, I, I can think believe that. that. There, there is a, a middle ground here. It is not a choice between complete atheism and a physical explanation of everything as the scientists many scientists would have and the other side of it where there is a a, a being that we normally consider to be would 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 have the characteristics of god as we know him i'm suggesting that that there quite possibly is and could be some kind of of unthinkable principle that could create an infinite number of universes and play games with them on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, as I said. Hmm. So I, I would agree with, with um, our caller here. Okay. And, L and um, you know, that, but, but I, I have been emphasizing that we need to clean up the physical part of our act and then consider those concepts. All right. Uh, one more call, I think. David in uh, on the South Coast. You're on Talk Radio. Hi, David. Hi, Jane. Yeah. One, Hello, Neil. One quickie for Neil, if you'll Evening, excuse Dave. the expression. Very quickly, um, superior race, massively intelligent, obviously, slicing genes, which is incredibly uh, difficult to do. What do you think about this, by the way, David? You've been listening to this. Do you think there's any validity um, in your mind or well, not? Well, I would say, uh, to put a, this guy, you seem to be basing, Neil, all of your facts on documents and you say the teachings are passed down to us if we had a third year world war tomorrow and we were left with a stack we found a stack of national inquirers um <laughs> if i built a theory out of that i think everybody think i was balmy I, I don't think you can re refer to the bible and the old testament and various other uh no, but I, i'm sort of... talking about this, these these other um yeah okay go papers on. okay sort right. of explain. anyway well it's pure, so you've got a superior race they um spice these genes so they're obviously alchemists yet they come looking for gold they use slaves, which, always is, which is always a sign of bar barbarism, but they don't use machines, where they've also got a machine to fly here. So there seems to be a number of anomalies, um, well, which I find a yeah, bit confusing. That, that's a good point. I mean, listen, we, are, we've even got machines. And what do they want this gold for? Okay. Sorry. Here, okay, two things. Three things. One is they do, the, the ancient documents do describe very advanced machines that sound like lasers that they used for mining. They right. had uh, flying machines. They had... Why did they use slaves? Why did they? Mm. Yeah. They well, just use machines in South Africa now. They use main, main use. So why, why did... What, what, There's an interesting point, actually, Neil. David says, why, why did they... Why did they decide to uh, enslave us or to uh, produce us uh, out of genetic engineering when they really didn't need it? They could have just got on and used machines. They just use huge machines. You've got the yeah, all right, all right David. So, well, somebody, somebody has to run the machines. <laughs> well, they I mean, can. Got somebody has to do. They? Somebody has to do the farming and the gardening and and uh, serving at table and the cooking and the and the metal smithing and the leather working and all that kind of stuff. So they found us very helpful for that. Uh, and I'm only saying that that is what the ancient documents say. Why right. they why they needed to, you know, psychologically or from any other point of view, I, I can't answer that. Yeah. I'm I'm simply saying what the ancient documents say. It doesn't make a lot now, of sense, though, does it? Really. Um, it does to me, but then again, you know, um, I have an opinion and you have an opinion and yeah. they're equal in weight in this particular case. Okay, interesting point, David. Thanks for that. You're going to have the last word there, there David. Was, there, was an, there was another word, though, that, another question that David answered that was really... What did they need the gold for? 
Oh, okay. Two that things, was... as best we can tell. But I'm going to be out of here in 30 seconds or so. Okay, well then maybe I better not. We'll get into that. Um, ask uh, David. Ask um, the future uh, guest, uh, Sir Lawrence Gardner, about the white monoatomic form of gold and what they used it for. Okay, now listen. Uh, we can find out more about this uh, business if you go to Neil's uh, website, www.transmute.co.uk. Uh, no, that's, that's the transmute. Uh, my okay. site is a different address. All right. Well, listen. I'll that, give it that, to that, you. That's, you the, can... that's the conference, isn't it? That's, right, the, that's, that's the conference, yes. Yeah. Now, which is being held here in uh, Salisbury at the Guildhall between the 19th of March and the 21st. And if they want to find out more, they can go to that on the internet. Or, if you want to find out, drop me a line to James Whale at Talk Radio, PO Box 1089, London, W1A, 1PP, and put uh, Neil on the envelope and I'll know what it means. Uh, Neil, I've got to go. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the program. Thank you. And it's maybe we'll pleasure. have a chance to talk when you're over here. Very good. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.